Welcome to The Third Story, I'm Leo Sidrin. Today's conversation features Jason Moran, and that music that you hear behind me is Jason playing James P. Johnson's Carolina Shout last year at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Jason Moran is a pianist, composer, conceptual artist, educator, and public intellectual. His work explores the interconnectedness of jazz, history, and physical space. Jason is incredibly prolific. He was named a MacArthur Fellow in 2010. He's the artistic director for Jazz at the Kennedy Center, and he teaches at the New England Conservatory. He's released 15 solo albums, nine of them on Blue Note Records, and more recently on his own Yes record label, which he runs with his wife, vocalist Alicia Hall Moran. He scored a handful of films, including Selma, and most recently, Ava DuVernay's documentary, 13th. He's also been a valued sideman and collaborator to many great jazz artists, including Greg Osby, Cassandra Wilson, Charles Lloyd, and Christian McBride, among so many others. And he's had shows at the Venice Biennial, Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, the Wexner Center for the Arts in Columbus, Ohio, and at the Whitney Museum in New York. That was just at the end of 2019, and for that project, part of what he did was to recreate the stages from three legendary New York jazz clubs in the museum and then perform on those stages. Right now, Jason is in the midst of curating what will become a permanent exhibition at the Louis Armstrong House Museum in, of all places, Corona, Queens. There's so much music that I could play you to demonstrate Jason's fluidity and musicality, how he straddles the avant-garde, blues, classical music, stride piano, hip-hop, post-bop. But I wanted you to hear him playing this piece of music for a couple of reasons. First of all, I saw him do a live stream concert from his apartment earlier this quarantine, and he played the Carolina Shout there as well. And before he played it, he explained that this was a piece of music that so many of the great piano players back in the day learned how to play, including one of his favorites, Fats Waller. In fact, Jason had a project several years ago in which he reframed the music of Fats Waller in a contemporary and personal way. He's all about that, reframing, reassessing, and complicating the relationship between music, history, and place. His work is often geared towards challenging the status quo while at the same time respecting what came before him. Anyway, I know he's been thinking about the Carolina Shout for a while now, and that he's even thinking about expanding it into a concert-length suite. So we started by talking about that, and then we launched. I can't think of anyone I would rather talk to right now than Jason Moran. Here we consider so much about history, so much about the present moment in our country, so much about Louis Armstrong. The conversation is as deep as it is wide, so get ready. Third-story.com is the place to go. You know this, to sign up and subscribe. Check the archive, say hello, maybe even become a patron. I've put together a Spotify playlist that includes some of Jason's work, as well as some of the music that we talk about here today. And there are also some videos of Jason for you to check out on the website. Here's me talking to Jason Moran earlier this week. Hello. Jason Moran, nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. You too. How's the uh, Carolina shout coming? Oh, well, I mean, I'm always going to say it's in it's in the repair shop, but <laughs> <laughs> but I've you know in private I feel like I've done some great things. In public, sometimes I, you know, it's like getting on a roller coaster, and you say, "Oh, I know it's going to turn here. I know it's going to turn there," and you you get ready for it. And then sometimes in public, this shit just goes off the rails. You're like, what just happened? <laughs> I saw you do a live stream about a month ago where you played it. And one of the things you said is that you're working on a 45 minute version of it. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I'm ready for that. I think about like long form songs in jazz per se. You know, sometimes we, you know, find a way to limit their time frame for whatever reason. And, uh, and many of them are good. You know, some people don't need to be playing all day. Um, but I feel like a, that piece is a long form that can really be strung out, you know, and let all the ideas rather than them kind of come in these sections. But like, OK, now let's explode that, you know, change the tempo, change, move, make it let one song like a full, like feel like it's a set. That's mm -hmm. my goal. I started working on it about a year and a half ago in preparation for a concert my wife and I were doing for Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. It was called Two Wings, The Music of Black America in Migration. And it was 
a concert around the great migration and how it affected America, but also how black musicians chose to leave signs and codes in all these songs that they had written hmm. from across the diaspora of black music, especially jazz and classical music and folk music. And um, so you hear songs like, say, you know, Carolina Shout, you know, like a song that when James B. Johnson would, you know, be in a red party, somebody say, well, take us back home, you know? Hmm. So these are people who had gotten to New York from other places, that states down south. So they wanted to feel like this thing, make us jump, make us howl, you know? And so songs are supposed to do that, you know, give us a way to um, to hear and feel ourselves and also tell us where we want to go, you know? All these people, you know, like Roy Eldridge making Wabash Stomp. This is much about Chicago and that street, but for people who are ready to get out, they know that they can go to Wabash Street, mm -hmm. you know, in Chicago and say, well, folks is going up there. So many millions of people are arriving in Chicago from the South that it's a place, it's not just how great that song is. <laughs> it really is like saying like, look, here, here's a place for us, you know. Duke Ellington, Harlem on my mind, you know, a tone parallel to Harlem, right? You. He's like, okay, these are neighborhoods, right? This is landscape, this is geography. And if we're in a state of trauma, you know, for African-Americans during that time and present day, we still are looking for where is the safe space? And sometimes people say it in the title, you know, come here. When we scheduled this interview a week and a half ago, even at that point, I was really eager to talk to you. I thought this was a especially significant time to talk to you about how you're feeling in the world because as the pandemic reshapes our relationship with the public space and with gathering in groups yeah. you are in the midst of putting together an exhibition at the Louis Armstrong House Museum that will live there permanently and will hopefully be available for people to visit when this is quote unquote all over yeah. and in fact I just yeah. wanted to get a sense from you about how you're thinking about putting together projects in the public space because you have devoted so much of your career to thinking about how to reframe and reorient the work that you do in public spaces, like putting music together to be performed in museums, for example. But in the week since we put this conversation on the books, so much has changed in the country as people all over take to the streets to protest, some of it resulting in a lot of violence, and the country as a whole meditates on race relations. So I guess really what I want to know is what are you thinking about right now? Well, I mean, Louis Armstrong, one, is a figure that deserves so much investigation because he lives through a time and also is, takes advantage of the technology that's around him. So he's documented in photographs. Mm. He has his own typewriter, writes his own letters. He records himself on the road with his reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, right? Mm. He does all these things of himself, and people also propose their own frame around him, too, mm. right? So he's often kind of like wedged into a corner, right? He finds his way through freedom out of it. He has conversations with his friends in private to kind of reconcile what he's feeling as a performer. Um, and so... When I always, you know, the thing for all, I'm sure all, you know, musicians who are conscious and want to play a music they might call jazz, hmm. you all, you have to reckon with how the music was born. You have to reckon with how it dealt with the, the systems in place that kept it oppressed and the people oppressed. You have to reckon with the idea that musicians took the bandstand not only for their own sanity, but that it was a place that they could cut loose without fear of kind of getting, you know, hit in the mouth or lynched. You have to say that that's generations and generations of musicians we've all watched kind of do this, promote the freedom principles. Mm -hmm. And um, so for me, it's not a coincidence that Ornette Coleman makes a record called Free Jazz in the 60s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like that's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Like that's a principle that people are continuing to strive for.
W.B. Du Bois is striving for at the beginning of the 20th century. James Baldwin is striving for it 50 years later, right? So people are thinking about this. And the music ends up being the place where people can sift through the ideas, right? So we hear John Coltrane take the 30-minute solo, you know, and saying, I'm not finished thinking about this. And you know what? Here's a place you have not been able to shut me up. <laughs> right? It's profound. It's profound. So here we are, 2020, mm -hmm. and we're all considering, you know, where we were. But I think all of us who have been conscious of what the situation has always been and that this is a routine that has been happening for hundreds of years, I mean, hundreds of years in this country to a specific black body, you know, then we know what our work is at the piano or at the mm -hmm. drum set or at the microphone or when we tell a story, when we talk to someone, we know what our job is to do. And so the music is always has that layer inside it. And so now I'm listening to Louis Armstrong with that layer inside it. You know what I mean? You know, the, the record he makes at the very end of his life, you know, with Oliver Nelson, mm -hmm. you know, like, and they're playing, they're kind of like remixing those songs <laughs> for a 70s era, you know, the dawn of the 70s. And he's kind of making this more funky version of What a Wonderful World. <laughs> I see trees of green. Red roses too, I see them blue for me and you, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I love that notion that the bandstand was one of the few places where a black artist could actually find some freedom. I learned through your revisiting Monk's town hall concert that Monk had been beaten up by a state trooper shortly before he did that concert. Yeah. And this was a person who was totally in the search of freedom and expression, but he mm -hmm. was subject to the same right. kind of violence that so yes. many people are. And, you know, and you have to say that everyone, every musician that you love from that era, you know, up till now has been subject to it. What are the stories about Ella Fitzgerald that we don't know, mm -hmm. right? the slights against her as a performer, as a black woman on stage, of Billie Holiday, right? We kind of see those, how they mm -hmm. kind of indict her over and over, you know, on the stage, mm -hmm. indict her, her her way of life. Um, we have to consider that. And those stories, look, people aren't walking around professing them all the time, but they find their ways into those songs, into mm -hmm. the cracks of the song, and how they pull and yank on the song, you know? By virtue, of one of the freedom principles is you change the narrative of who's telling the story, right? So there's something so beautiful about when you have artists take the song of someone else, totally bring it into their world and, and just kind of like squeeze all the juice out of it. Take the rind, bite the rind, and then throw it into the trees, right? And then you, you taste this like bitter side to the song that you never would have thought when you heard it in the Broadway musical. Right. And uh, it's that kind of power to take overtake a song mm -hmm. nina simone maybe you know does this so greatly sure. to overtake a song that is it also in our power my favorite thing is john coltrane yanking that song into his into his world you know mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a it's a power grab hmm. Hmm. And so, look, I have been looking at how Louis Armstrong has the songs that he wrote earlier in his life and then the songs he recorded late in his life, you know, like and how they came to him, who introduced them to him, you know, and then how he slung them, you know, or how he added his slang or his phrase to it. You know, yeah. how do you kind of like manipulate the song? So it's a place that we have to take advantage of as artists without feeling like we are also being taken advantage of. What do you mean by that? You know, the other side of, of recording music written by other composers is that you offered them a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those songs that he's recording for everyone else really makes them, the, the publisher and the composer, a ton of money. Mm -hmm. You know, standards have been great for a very long time, but also from a world where I was taught by musicians from the AACM, like Muha Richard Abrams, Anthony Braxton, Henry Threadgill, Amina Claudine Myers, Wadada Leo Smith, musicians who really focused on, no, we have a canon. 
James Reese Europe kind of preaches this, you know, in the 19 teens, you know, like we have a canon, right? We have songs, <laughs> we can write them and we can perform them, right? Mm. And it has to be a focus on that also. And that then becomes like how you build up a library of, you know, composition that really documents us as a people. You have revisited the work of a lot of people over the years. This is part of what you often do. Fats Waller and mm -hmm. Mingus and Monk. And yeah. how do you approach kind of crawling into the skin of the artist when you want to revisit it in your own way? I mean, you know, anytime you're tackling the music of someone else, you know, you have to be humble. But after a certain point, you also have to kind of like, you know, like what if you ever, I mean, I used to have snakes when I was a kid. Huh. And one of the most beautiful moments is watching a snake realize that they're going to get out of their skin. So they find a rock and they nudge their nose against the rock to break it. Right. And then they slowly work that skin off of them. And then they come out fresh and they disc and the skin is discarded behind them. So something like that, you have to kind of birth yourself in mm. to the music of, uh, of Monk, uh, of, of James Reese Europe, of Mingus and of uh, Fats Waller and even Fats Waller. I mean, I had to even go so far as put to, the mask on to get a mask. Yes. I had to go all the way. <laughs> Are you a different person in the mask? It's a little bit bizarre. I used to only perform in it for a little while. And then over the years, it just got longer and longer. So then I'd spend an hour inside there. And you have to also, and this is paper mache. So inside here is its own chamber, mm -hmm. you know, so all acoustics are out of the window. There's no acoustics. It's just a roar, 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 right? So <laughs> it's kind of like being John Malkovich or something, you know, uh, but being Fats Waller. So, but any of them, you know, in the way that I look at each composer and performer is where they are in the history, you know, what are the things that they are battling, you know, around them that you can tell societally what's happening for them. Even for like, say, Thelonious Monk, I, you know, that one, if they didn't know the fact that most African-Americans are walking around with the last name that was given to them by their slave master, then we should say it around the coolest name that we think is Monk. But it's also the badge of possibly one of the worst things in history, you know? So it's that double edge of that, you know, to understand that, oh, my God, Monk is a plantation, you know, mm, uh. it's a plantation. So we have you have to wrestle with that while you wrestle with the music, too. Yes. And for Fats Waller, it was that a person who is so full of joy is also battling so much pain, too. I mean, his life ends early, but he's also, you know, that's how that works. It's how, you know, it's how the balance of life kind of plays itself out. So in any one of them, I have to find what I feel is uh, essential. And I also know that for all of the work that I've done as a musician, I will only be smarter if I learn their music and, and, and find stories that are inside it that nobody in my music history class at Manhattan School of Music decided to teach me. I have to make sure that I'm still investigating as a, as a consummate artist. Well, I've heard you talk about that. Like, for example, I know that you know, the relationship with Jackie Bayard was so yes. significant to you, not only musically, but personally, and that the kind of conversations you would have yeah. were illuminating. Yeah, every Monday with Jackie Bayard from 1993 to 1997, you know, those years, I mean, I grew so much. Uh, you sit at two pianos uh, and Jackie breaks down life. He breaks it down in the hands. He shows you things. The lessons where I'd show up and I wouldn't necessarily want to play, then I'd just ask him questions about his life about him being in the war, you know, about him being in an interracial couple, his thoughts on integration as it was happening. His, you know, what, what was it like with Eric Dolphy? You know what I mean? So Jackie became kind of like the prime example for me to also how to deal with history. Because in his hands, he could go free. He could he could deal with stride. And he was everybody, you know, the piano players who knew him, they were like, Jackie's the one, you yeah. know. Cecil Taylor, when I first met Cecil Taylor, I told him I was a student of Jackie Byard. He said, mm, Jackie Byard, no one knows more about the piano than Jackie Byard. <laughs> <laughs> I felt so proud, you know? Yeah. Because I also remember in my lessons, Jackie talking about Cecil Taylor used to come see me play all the time, right? So there's something that people are like, so it tells you about kind of how the environment works. So for me to be with him, I mean, he was the reason I moved to New York was to just to study with him. And I was coming from Houston, but I needed to be with a master like that. It was just something about how he was playing with Mingus's group that just seemed to embody it all, but in a very kind of, you know, different, you know, yeah, I don't know, perspective.
So if you have to wrestle with the personality of all of the artists that you start to think about, you know, whether it's Fats Waller or or Monk or whoever it is, and think about their life, not only the notes, but the life, what are you wrestling with with Louis Armstrong? What are the questions that you're confronting? I mean, all this stuff is still under, under investigation. <laughs> but, you know, one part is around how he, his life begins. And uh, I was looking at a photograph that, that Gordon Parks, great photographer, took of Louis Armstrong. And it's, you know, it's kind of dark, but, you know, and Lewis is playing the trumpet and he's looking at the camera and then behind him is kind of this gilded bronze. Can't really tell what it is, but it's like a framing device around Lewis Armstrong. You know, this kind of like dark royalty, you mm-hmm. know, because the image is kind of dark. It's very different than like, say, the Life magazine cover, like where Lewis is, is in this entirely white background, right? Looking up, meaning the camera is in a power position hmm. over him, right? looking up at this camera and blowing up to it, you know? Um, so there's something about that. And uh, I showed the image to my wife, Alicia, and and she said, oh, there's something to that he's connected to that you should talk about, uh, that you should find more about. And I understood that as, you know, where, who are his ancestors? In the same way that I look at Thelonious Monk, like, well, who are his ancestors, right? Like, we should trace it back. And it's traceable now back to 1818 to his great grandmother. It's traceable. And that we have to think about his origin story, not as simply as a person who pulled himself up mm-hmm. by his bootstraps, but that he comes from a line of people, you know, a line of people get to him and then he, he flowers out. So that's like the, one of the first things. I'm just so excited. I mean, I talked to Robin Kelly, the historian, um, last week, mm. last Friday, we had this discussion. Yeah. <laughs> And he's and he and Robin Kelly said, "Oh, you have to think about it like this." And um, and he sent me this research, and so there's so much more to continue to try to find. You know, some of the answers to. I'm also kind of curious about the numbers around Louis Armstrong. You know, like okay, how many hits did he have? Right. So, how much money did he generate? Yeah. You know, like like when they say like, "Oh, Louis Armstrong, eight Grammy awards," blah blah blah. You know, like how they like to yeah. parry off the list of. In West End Blues, he played 782 huh. notes. You know, I, I <laughs> the kind of way I want to, I want to kind of mark the numbers in his life too. Um, and then thirdly is I think his relationship with his his wife Lucille, and she really cements his legacy for me. I think um, the music is great, but she somehow for New York City gets the city involved mm-hmm. to keep the house that he lived in, right? to maintain this archive, to start a foundation. These are the things of the future that here, 50 years after he has passed away, that we're here like looking through, listening to tapes, looking at his writings, looking at his photographs, looking at his collages he made for his tape cases. Mm -hmm. We can sit, we can touch it. Yeah. And literally in the music world, we spend our time making things that are invisible. Mm But Lewis wanted to leave a document. So he left rows and rows of documents for us. Well, you say in the music world, we make things that are invisible. But for you, a relationship with the visual world seems to have been kind of baked into the development process. You seem to have been sort of familiar with the idea of visual arts. And even when I think about it, just the idea of art, not just playing music, but the idea that, you know, music lives in the world of art and art has a function in the world in society definitely and I, all of it's because of how i grew up in houston texas with my parents and they really were adamant to have a household that was surrounded with all kinds of art from sculpture to instruments to pottery to paintings to catalogs about places we'd never really go to until you know <laughs> so here we were living in a kind of a black middle class neighborhood and my parents were really trying to also introducing the ideas to us that were global. Um, yeah. When I moved out of Houston to New York, it was also that if I couldn't go hear music at night, then in the daytime you could go to museums, you know? So you should see the, the migration series that Jacob Lawrence painted, you know, these series of paintings that document this mass movement. You know, like there were just things that I, you're in New York, you go see them. Jazz is not working all day. Yeah. <laughs> it works at night. <laughs> it works late. So... In the daytime, I would really spend my time going to see work. And then getting on the road, I would spend my time on the road going to museums over and over again. And something would happen where I would hear and see jazz 
you know, whether it was in a film or whether it was in, you know, in somebody's um, how they thought about a painting, you would hear these these responses to our music. But they weren't necessarily taught to us as mm -hmm. as students or that we think of Duke Ellington as a multimedia performer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the way I put him. You know, he had he had dance. He had costumes. He had backdrop. Uh, he had positioning of that stage, you know, the design of all the music stands. I mean, it's, 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 it's all the way. And of course that's an era, but if I look at it now and like write down the list, I mean, that's what I aim to be. So I'm, you know, also thinking about people like Herbie Hancock, who when I was growing up, it wasn't the miles stuff or the seventies stuff. It was that he made rocket and he had robots in it mm -hmm. who were dressed up and who were kind of like break dancing and taking the solo at the same time. So people who kind of like, pull the ideas and mash them up all together. Those seem to be the kinds of artists I'm, I'm attracted to of all disciplines, not simply in jazz. You say this thing about how, you know, jazz is up all night, but it's not working during the day. But one of the things that you have done is work to make it happen during the day by putting it in kind of institutional frameworks that do take place during the day. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, what is it like to bring jazz, one way of saying it is it into daylight? <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't want to be so bold and say, you know, that statement that it doesn't work in the day. It's definitely working yeah. in the day. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely is. But I think, you know, the time part is big, right? So you go to Japan and you play a concert, they their concerts at the Blue Note are like at 5, yeah. 4.30 in the afternoon. Yeah. Like It's not like 9 and 11 yeah. or 11 and 1. So there's a thing about time that we have to think about. And, you know, a series of concerts I did at the Whitney Museum recently in conjunction with the e exhibition was called uh, Jazz on a High Floor in the Afternoon. Uh, <laughs> and it's a, it's a phrase. It's The Jazz on a High Floor was by a great artist named David Hammonds. And during a dinner we were having, he said, you know, because he's a he's around musicians all the time. Yeah. And Hammonds is a great artist. And he said, you know, jazz should happen on a high floor in the afternoon, you know, in on a high floor and in the afternoon. Yeah. Actually, he said the whole phrase. Yeah. It's all David Hammonds phrase. And it was just an opposite to like late at night and deep underground thinking about my, you know, village vanguard years or whatever. So there's a lot to that to, to help reframe it. And also it's a different audience that goes to see that music too. If we always consider that an artist must come to a jazz club, then I agree that they should feel what it is like in those spaces where we're cramped. Hopefully we'll get back to that, you know, feeling of being close to one another and listening to music together. But I think there's, you know, there's something about kind of like just changing the, 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 the grounding and the setting that is what, you know, is what theater is about too. And if you're in a museum, the museum goer is walking in to see something. They're in here listening too. The person who's going to a club is going to listen. They're going to see stuff too, but the listening kind of takes, takes you know, is the muscle that's working the most. But in the museum, so how do we kind of like switch those those ideas up all the time to see what happens? And hmm. the audience is very different and, and they're all valuable. And I think for us, we have to continue to find audiences that are valuable. I was really struck by the idea of recreating a stage like the slug stage in a museum because obviously you can stand in front of that set piece and perform yeah. and it can evoke something. But of course, it's not it's not the same experience as walking into slugs. No, it's not. And no, it, it is not. <laughs> and, but it, it almost seems like an intentional point to make that like by putting it in a museum, it is not the thing. It is not. It's a representation of the thing. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the thoughts I had around the stages were somehow black creative spaces and stages were not documented, mm. overly documented, just period. And uh, by the 70s, that slugs, you know, like like consumer photography is everywhere. Yeah. People have the cameras and somehow there just aren't a zillion images of this club. There are probably less than 100, maybe less than 50. It's very few. And uh, so how does that become a trend? Because the same amount of images that we have of the Savoy Ballroom, is almost how many images we have 50 years later about slugs. Interesting. And, and, uh, and as a person who also, you know, we listen to records and what is the plug nickel, you know, like, like we're listening to Miles in that room, you know, playing and like, oh, we're listening to the music, though. But yes, I think the exactly. other really Im important part is also what's the room. The room, you know, the Vanguard feels a certain way. You know. Well, Go yeah, ahead. but I think that that speaks to this question of, OK, if the Vanguard is hallowed ground and, and it has a sound, it influences the music that happens there and it influences yeah. the way people feel 
when they're hearing it. It influences the way yeah. their bodies react to it. Does the music, can it have the same impact in a museum or is that not the point? For me, it wasn't the point. The point was around, especially for the performers who came to the Whitney in New York, was the, the, it was around the, the, the kind of like the, the intersection. So a performer who would never get a chance to play at, at the Savoy Ballroom all of a sudden standing up there. They're not at the Savoy Ballroom, yeah. but they are now under this incredibly bizarre arch that was in the Savoy Ballroom that none of us really get a chance to perform in. So even mm. it as a possible stage yeah. then kind of like makes people have to think about where they are. Yeah. And that's the thing I think sometimes for us musicians, of course, we consider where we are. We do. We travel all around the world. We walk into clubs and concert halls and on festival stages outside. And we're like, where are we? Or why does it sound this way? Or can the sound get better or worse? We have those conversations. Hmm. But I think in the museum, it was more like, having people experiment with what that intersection could be. So inviting Archie Shep, who played at Slugs, was like, okay, come on, Archie, will you do this? Will you fly from Paris so we can play some duo? Yeah, yeah. I'll do it. You know, Or having Charles Lloyd do it when we did it at the Walker Art Center that originated this exhibition. I also think about clubs across the country as I go to places like Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. in Chicago, all the clubs there. What did Lincoln Gardens look like? There's only one image I've seen of Lincoln Gardens where mm. Louis Armstrong was playing with King Oliver. So, you know what I mean? Like, what are these places that also become so important to the lore? Yes. You know? Th this whole idea of place and location and space, I think in the conversation around the music in recent years, I've been wondering about it, you know, because you have people who are so interested in jazz who find it all over the world, you know, in all kinds of different contexts, and they can study it in all these different ways. And I like this thing that you come to over and over again, where you say, well, there's a lot that they don't teach you in school. There's a lot about playing yeah. the music that they're not going to teach you even in the greatest conservatory with the greatest teachers. You're not going to get it there. Right. You're going to get it from people and you're going to get it from place. Yeah. And you have to experiment with it too. My first like gig outside of the country while I was in college was with Greg Osby and, and we were in Vienna, Austria. I use my passport. I get there. You know, there's so much I don't know. All I know is I can do this. <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what I'm eating. I don't know anything else. I don't know how to say anything, you know. And so a lot of us, you know, musicians have dealt with that feeling over and over again. And we kind of grow a muscle to be able to to respect that feeling. And then we respect an audience who also shows up to want to have that feeling with the music that they listen to. It's very important that you generate that kind of thinking for your audience that you can walk into a room and not know and then feel and then, oh, shit, you know, you can have that. It's really important for people to do that, to not know the outcomes. Um, and maybe that's kind of what America is mm -hmm. feeling so powerfully right now. They're not really sure. This is not 1968. How do we push through this virus? Right. Like, so there's so much that is like squashed into this moment. Yes. And it's really uh, rattling us all. It's rattle, rattling everyone. So here we are in this time. You give a lot of credit to your parents for turning you on to art and being art appreciators. I also think about the role of location and place in your development because you are part of a generation that came through the high school of the performing and visual arts in Houston. When I look at the people that were at that school within a four-year range of you, between <laughs> yeah. the piano players, yourself, Robert Glasper, James Francis, Helen Sung, and the drummers, Chris Dave, Kendrick Scott, Eric Harland. It's like contemporary jazz would not be the same without <laughs> a, gener a generation of people from Houston. You know, I feel like every city kind of gets, gets a moment, right? Like Philadelphia or New Orleans or Chicago, right? Like LA right now. London, right? Like South Africa, right? I mean, Cape Town or, or uh, Joburg, right? Like you feel these moments when cities kind of like, whoa, yes, and then the wave comes, right? And and, it, and you feel it enter the scene. And while we were in Houston, we really had a great program and it still con continues to this day. Unbelievable program with stellar musicians graduating from it. And um, so to be in a school where your competition was at such a high level <laughs> just from people in your class. It was kind of really great. Um, our band director, Bob Morgan, put us into some shape. And by the time I got to New York, I really felt that eh, 
you know, the musicians at Manhattan School of Music. I was like, eh, yeah, you can, you're okay. I was like, but you should, you should, when my friend Eric Harlan comes up here next year, he's going to graduate when Eric Harlan, yeah, he's, you know, <laughs> and it was like that, right? And then people kind of kept coming to New York and then we had a, a real family and we always keep in touch with each other and put each other on because we've also watched other cities kind of maintain this kind of, uh, this uh, relationship and, you know, yeah, we're thankful for it too. You know, Houston's, Jazz history is deep, you know, from the Texas tenors, Arnett Cobb, Illinois Jaquette, the big bands that were there, Jewel Brown, singer with uh, Louis Armstrong, right? Like Joe Sample then kind of like yeah. comes and then does this other thing, right? So this, we have a ton of it in the city. It is often underpromoted. And I think now like people say, oh, okay, there's a Houston thing that is, you know, yeah. that exists. And uh, and so, you know, we, we work hard to maintain it too. I've heard you talk about how Although you started playing music early on, you were really more interested in hip hop until you heard Monk. Yeah. What was it in Monk's playing, do you think? You know, um, I often think about it, but I think Monk perforates his music and leaves holes in it so that you could put yourself inside it. And uh, he leaves space for you. Um, and I think some it's intimidating if you don't want to deal with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I didn't have any of that language when I was 13, 14, when yeah. I heard it for the first time. I felt like more like what I was hearing was such a dedication to the downbeat in his left mm. hand that I felt like that has the same kind of bounce as I hear in a KRS-One song. So there was something about like, mm, this is going, this is going down. And then in the 90s, people started sampling him too. So there's this great moment in music where you have RZA from Wu-Tang sampling Monk playing Ellington. Mm -hmm. So that gives us, you know, like 70 years of distance of black music right in one sample. <laughs> and it's, uh, and you know, that started to happen too, where since hip hop was also sampling so much music, it also, it became a kind of, if you looked at the samples, it would be a playlist for the power of black music. And you'd see, you'd hear these little segments, whether it was Ahmad Jamal, whether it was Art Blakey, Horace Silver, or Monk, or, and you'd hear them all kind of get repurposed. And that feeling that, that there was a kind of a sewing in of history without necessarily everybody even knowing it, you know, but sewing in of a kind of integrity yeah. into these songs that felt like you know hip-hop is important it's important because it reflects on its previous music history models you recognized the thread between monk and wu-tang clan and the connection between jazz and hip-hop mm. which was something that was talked about a lot in the early days of hip-hop but i think maybe that link was ultimately overlooked for a time and the music went in other directions right. until eventually a new generation yeah. of musicians who were really raised up on both yeah. a diet of jazz and hip hop emerged and that's your generation. Yeah. I mean it's my generation too but you have been among those jazz musicians who really create connection between the two. Yeah, you know Robert Glasper right behind me he really dives into it as a, as an important part of musical legacy. You know, I mean, of oh, course, yeah. all music has problems. Hello. You no know, music like lives on like, oh, this is the great gilded era of blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, we know our histories, our uh, relationships to money, relationships mm -hmm. to, to drugs, mismanagement that happened in, in jazz for, for decades and decades and decades that take advantage of it. And mm -hmm. same happens in hip hop, you mm -hmm. know, but always there's bright moments in it, right? Bright moments that lead to lots of other discoveries and it was important for i think for our generation to say that nah this is really an integral part of american history and this music has gone around the globe right and has empowered people the same way if we were if we're researching jazz the same way jazz has mm -hmm. so it was why i kind of really stand behind it and really also push the kennedy center to implement a hip-hop program and we have q-tip from a tribe called quest as kind of like our artistic advisor for that program this is really important to say it. 
you have to say it rather than say, oh, no, I'll let other people say it, but we're not going to act like this has as much mm-hmm. credit and resources as, you know, a Beethoven string quartet. Eh, I think, you know, they're about equal. Wow. <laughs> it's okay to say it. Yeah. And people should say it. It's very difficult for us also to relate to a time that's so far away from us and in Germany. Meanwhile, we can't relate to the person who's like across the river. (laughs) Well, so if the music is a manifestation of the person, it can be difficult to relate to the person sometimes, particularly if you're talking about somebody who was in Germany hundreds of years ago. But I wonder about that when it comes to somebody like Louis Armstrong, you know, because I think that as a young listener or student of music even, it can be a challenge. I mean, some of the heaviest players I know will tell me that it took them a long time to confront Louis Armstrong and understand that that was for real and that you still have to deal with it. It's not a was musical statement. It's still present. Yeah. But there are so many conditions in the music and in the persona of Louis Armstrong that might lead a young person to look at that and say, what does that have to do with me? Mm, Yeah. A great music historian, Guthrie Ramsey, who's at University of Pennsylvania, I was in a class of his once, and he talked about when innovation becomes rhetoric, Mm -hmm. you know? If we want to count the innovations that Louis Armstrong made, right, if we want to really make that list, that is pretty lengthy list, you know? So he's he's like, like, when he's coming up, he's like, you know, people either played trumpet or they sang. They definitely didn't do both. And I really wanted to sing, but people wanted me to play trumpet. So I did that, you know, but then I pushed them together, right? And, or I scattered like that, or I took a solo like that, right? Or I'm able to play off of someone else like that, or I'm able to now step in front of the camera. There's a thing that makes him a little bit extra because he's able to do, he's given the opportunity to do all these things. And it's probably the only one, Mm -hmm. you know? So I've been talking to a lot of trumpet players about him. Um, So I was talking to Ambrose Akimusery the other day. You know, every once in a while I'll come across a photo in the archive and I send it to him, you know? And he's like, wow, who knew that, you know, Ornette Coleman was at Louis Armstrong's birthday party in the studio, <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, like, and he was saying, you know, like, it's rare to see a, uh, a musician with this kind of many shots of him yeah. in casual mode. But Lewis is on camera for decades. Yeah. And it's almost like it's not really offered to, I'm trying to think of other musicians who had that opportunity. It's not, it doesn't really happen that frequently. So well, he so- becomes the model, you know? Right, he becomes the model. But again, it's like, if, you know, when you looked at Fats Waller, there was a part of, the technique, the strategy, which was to say, I want to make this music in a way that will create the kind of physical reaction in contemporary people that the, the people of his day would have had. I'm going to take it and apply it to rhythmically in a way that feels yeah. like it's from today. Right. And I think that's a real interesting conceit to say you have to understand this music wasn't just like music you put on for dinner. This was music that you basically right. like, you went out <laughs> and wild out. Yeah. <laughs> No one to talk with all by myself No one to walk with but I'm happy on the shelf A misbehaving, saving my love for you For you, for you, for you There's one part of the pandemic where, and also having the assignment to to work with Armstrong's Mm -hmm. life, um, that is also really healthy right now, too. Because you see a devotion to the kind of love he's looking for, and he really does try to shoot it out there into his audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, early in some of his writings, he talks about, you know, you're not able, you know, in Storyville, you can't be black and then go hang out at the tables. He spends his entire career going out to the tables. Mm. Nah, I'm out here. I can live. I'm not going to get lynched. I'm out here, right? And he's trying to figure that out, like that that distance from the stage to the table, you know? And hmm. that's heavy. For a lot of musicians now, we ain't really trying to deal with the table. <laughs> just, I just want to play my music and I want to go away, you know? <laughs> I heard you say this thing about Monk being beaten. And you said, that's me. That's me sitting in front of my apartment in Harlem and saying the wrong thing when a police officer walks up to me. Yeah, it's that... It's that you know, you put your, yourself on the line all the time, whether you intend to or not. And I think 
for an artist like Armstrong, he he's very conscious of what's happening around him. He see, I mean, who doesn't see it? So even in his archive, there's a tape of the day that Martin Luther King is assassinated, and he's sitting in his in his room listening to the account over the radio, right? And in his library mm. is you know Amir Baraka's Blues People, is James Baldwin's If Beale Street Could Talk. I mean, so he's very like thinking about his role in all this, right? When he speaks out about, you know, the kids in Little Rock, he's trying to find his method, you know? And, but then he's still the artist. It's like, I still have to kind of like find these songs too. It's like, so he's kind of like dealing with a lot. Yeah. And also he's aging too. He's also really saying like, you know, this is going to be a lot of people's battle. And I've been fighting mine for a very long time. <laughs> and so he's a, he's a remarkable musician, and then that love thing that he has with his wife. I mean, he's had four wives, but the, by the time he reaches Lucille, then he really kind of knows how to be a partner. Yeah, It's beautiful how their love is documented. I mean, in the tapes that they have of them, you know, in a hotel room in Buenos Aires, you know, talking to each other, trying to sound out words in Spanish. I mean, it's really, they're forefront. They're groundbreaking in a way that they probably can't even imagine, yeah. but they're really like testing and touching new territory. Do you see part of what your work is to be a kind of advocacy? Oh, definitely. I mean, especially, you know, I'm an advocate because, first of all, because I have to take over a position that Dr. Billy Taylor led at the Kennedy Center. <laughs> so my passion for the music and for musicians and the stories they have to tell is first and foremost. And to be able to share people's visions on stage uh, is really important for the health of the music because people did the same thing for me. So I know that I have a duty to turn around and continue to leave the door wide open and let all kinds of air inside the room. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, even from that place right there, much like what you're doing here and what your father has done, like, you know, like I was just reading, somebody online was talking about the thankfulness they had for Ben Sidron's show. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, I, wa I was like, I just, I watched all those shows too. <laughs> I watched all of them, you know what I mean? Wow. Because they were important to, to have somebody stand and talk with the artist and then present a set of music, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then talk again. It was really important that all of a sudden there was another dimension that was unfolded. And that was before, you know, the way we kind of exist now. Yes. So, but it was kind of a foreshadowing of, of the kind of relevance that musicians had to their daily lives and to the music that they shared with people. And it, so it became a portal. Yeah. So we have to continue to support these portals. You seem so interested in sociology and history and the way politics and culture interacts with the music. I almost wonder if that's because of your relationship with the music or if the music is actually just a way for you to travel through all these other questions, if that makes yeah, any I sense. Think, yeah, it does. And they're both running at the same time. You know, if I had known that there was a thing called anthropology, maybe I would have, <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, I married a woman uh, who was a composition and anthropology uh, minor ah. <laughs> at Barnard, huh. right? So I met a feminist, a composer, and an anthropologist. <laughs> so I kind of hit the, you know, like jackpot by meeting Alicia yeah. um, <laughs> because she also really brings that sensibility into line. But we both kind of come from teachers who really sewed that into us, too. And they didn't do it like in a, you must study the history of such and such. They didn't do it like that. They were, they were like living, they were embodiments of it. Yeah. So you saw how they they related to history that then said, okay, so that's how, if I want to have a kind of career that they have, you know, I want to be like Jackie Byard, right? My wife, she wants to be like Shirley Verrett, you know, the great opera star. So, you know, that's kind of what people do. And um, but we also know that it's important to showcase it too. So we continue to try to find ways to really work alongside artists and writers and historians and filmmakers who who do the kind of work that we think is important because that becomes becomes a community that people are impacted by. What is it like to be in that kind of an intense collaborative personal relationship? You know, not that many people have the opportunity to share that much of their life and work with one person. Yeah, you know, relationships one are difficult. <laughs> so everybody kind of can testify to that. But also, both of us have grown from our relationships with each other that we have to test each other over and over. Look, believe me, it's exhausting. Uh, mm -hmm. Believe me, she's sitting outside the door waiting until I get out of here so she can come get on the piano. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like there's a battle for space. But I think what we both do is we continue to work with each other as frequently as we can on large projects. And that, for us, kind of like 
helps us generate in a way and also learn from one another. But the warning is, you know, never a musician should never marry another musician. <laughs> An actor should not never marry another actor. You know, I don't know. I also have great examples of love in my family to, to say if you fall in love with someone, then you kind of have to commit to that. And then I also think of Ossie Davis and Ruby D. like unbelievable, you know, producers, actors and activists. So they for us, that's kind of really, that's a great relationship. So we know that we can, hopefully we survive it. <laughs> right. Well, right. And the pandemic is putting every, everybody's life to the ultimate test. I mean, we're in here now. Sure. We're, we're in it now. Yeah. I heard you say in an interview in 2008, you said, I know that when I was 13 years old and I heard Monk, it was right at that time when my life was, I was absorbing everything and it changed the direction of my life. I heard you say at one point Monk saved your life. Yeah. For a time. And then you said almost as an afterthought, well, I wonder what my twin boys will be listening to when they're about 13 years old. And yeah. I'm guessing that they're coming up on 13. They are coming up on 13. <laughs> and I don't know what they're listening to. I'm not even I'm not even asking. Every once in a while they share with me some song they think is good, you know, and it's mostly because they think their friends thinks it's good. So I'm not even sure what their taste in music is yet. But yeah, believe me, I'm listening closely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, we're talking about education and advocacy and all this stuff. Have you found that when it comes to providing a kind of cultural framework to raise your own children in, that you have any uh, challenge or advice? Or, I mean, what, what is it like just applying all of this to your own life? We have twin boys, and they're amazing. But last night, I think I heard something that one of them said as we were watching, um, I don't know, maybe America's Got Talent, mm -hmm. as we were watching. Yep. And um, so this person came on to sing the song and then they started and then my son he, he just changed the channel he's like all those songs they always sound like that they always sound the same i was like my work is done yep. <laughs> <laughs> i was like he nailed it so i think because they have to listen to my wife and i make so much sound and they've had to kind of go to concerts over and over again and hear all kinds of music and see all kinds of dance performances and theater and whatever else that you know they're building up a like a like a like a taste right like what is and um there's also a legacy that you pass down with what you allow into the house and to have space in the house so look i'm can't wait until they have their own radio want to listen to their own music right and they kind of sequester themselves because that because i give spaces that my parents did for me too um but they also my parents also when i was like around that same age and it was into a lot of skateboarding i listened to a band called suicidal tendencies yeah sure suicidal tendencies is a great band really great band <laughs> but at that age it was having a, a negative effect on me oh check it out <laughs> and so my parents you know my parents they saw you know like why are you drawing these kinds of symbols and you know like they just took the record away yeah and uh so that was also a big moment for me to learn which was you also as a parent have to be still also listening to and when you're looking for how does it kind of like affect uh, it, it really affected me but it was i was also helpful that they took the record away it's good to have records that are banned. What are you talking about with your boys in terms of what's happening out on the street right now? Or, or how are you seeing it in terms of what a young black man would be experiencing? Every parent has their own things that they have to discuss about how they grew up, the, the, the pressures they felt. For black children, it's a conversation that happens weekly. You know, it, it's happened ever since the beginning. And even recently, there were just a few shootings and murders on our block uh, at the beginning of this year that sparked a conversation in our building, in our neighborhood. And some people thought that bringing in more police would help. And mm. I was like, this is the opposite. It's the opposite. It doesn't help anything. Mm. It creates more fear for me. It creates more fear for my children if they're there around because all of the incidents that have happened for centuries. So I think, you know, for myself as a parent, this is a constant conversation and it won't stop after the protests stop. And they will have to teach it to their children, just like my father taught it to me and his grandfather taught to him. And there's also, you have to also, in, you have to give people strategies too. And you won't know if the strategy works until the moment that you're, mm. you're kind of like now under the gun and literally under the gun. Um, I mean, I remember a moment when myself, my brother, Eric Harlan, and another great drummer, Mark Simmons, were, you know, we were probably 18 and we were going to a music store in Houston and looking through, you know, looking through records. And then all of a sudden we noticed that people were following us around, right? So I was like, oh, yo, let's go into the classical section, which was hmm. in a separate, separate section behind a glass door, right? That these record stores used to have. So we walked in there, right? 
we looked at some records and then we came back out and when we came back out there were four police officers in the in the in the in the store and they put us all up against the wall and they held guns to us and then after they searched us one of my friends mark he started to pull his hands out and then they handcuffed him and threw him on the floor right so here's in this moment the fuck you know like we're kids and um mm. somehow the manager came over and said oh you know it's you know okay they don't have anything then it's okay but that thing is happening it's happening right now. It's happening right now somewhere in the city, in any city across mm-hmm. the country and around the world. And uh, as a traveling musician, mm-hmm. there's another code that we have to have about being out on the road, being out late, playing in clubs, talking to people. That is always a layer in how we work. And it's exhausting. But some of us have grown accustomed to the kind of tension that is that is in, prevalent in America and around the globe. And and we try to find strategies to move through it. And we look to people, you know, like Armstrong or Ellington or Sarah Vaughn, you know, or Billie Holiday. We look to people. How did Nina Simone deal with it? Yes. Right. She she went straight at it, you know, and we all try to find our way to figure out. But it's interesting. Nina had a lot of anger, rightfully so, of course. But I mean, she chose to go at it with anger and publicly yeah. and let that anger be seen. Yeah. Somebody like Ellington or Armstrong, they wouldn't show the anger. Hound dogs on my trail. School children sitting in jail. Black cat cross my path. I think every day is gonna be my last. Lord have mercy on the land of mine. We all gonna get it in due time. I don't belong here. I don't belong there. I've even stopped believing in prayer. Yeah, and what they each want to say is that there was. There also were other emotions besides that, right? So the anger would then create this thing, right? So he's like, in a tone parallel to Harlem, I have to paint my people also, right? So that's what artists are doing. Norman Lewis, an abstract artist, is not simply going to give you the face of, with the tears and the blood, but he's going to abstract it in a way. So mm-hmm. there are these ways that you have to look at the strategies, and you have to decode them, too, as a if you're looking back in history. And the ones that work. For you, then you have to say as an artist, then I have to stand by that. Yeah. And so it's a, it's an ongoing, you know, for all of us parents, it's ongoing. And we all are trying to build a better society for our, for our children, one that we weren't able to necessarily experience. Um, but we do have to give them tools from previous generations that say, okay, so in hindsight, now we can see that this worked. Maybe this needs a little bit of tweaking, you know, and then the generation will figure out what to do. You know, there is a very intense feeling right now in the country that maybe this is an inflection point or we're confronting something. But on the other hand, what I'm hearing you say is this has been confronted for hundreds of years. It will continue to be confronted. It will have to be. And and many of the confrontations won't be public and that you will be in some boardroom or some elevator or some, you know, locker room. And you will have to confront it there. Because for me, that's the other work that is really, really important. There have been many times where people have sat by in these other kind of private, more intimate settings and let stuff go, you know, go crazy. And then it goes out into the world. And then we get these these reactions, this evidence. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's maybe what people are hopefully waking up to. And I hope it's not like a Sunday sermon where someone hears that sermon on Sunday and they feel good that day. And then on Monday, they're like, yeah, fuck that. You know what I mean? Like they go back to their old ways. The country has a way of doing that. And, you know, if any of us who've been looking at it understand that it does, it has a way to forget. It wants to promote that forgetting, you know, but in our music, we know that it's in, it's on record. Yes. You know, and that, you know, it's on record. And so the protests are on record. People cannot turn away from it. And so people have to confront themselves in it, you know, as a part of it, too. To some extent, maybe that speaks to your ability in the music and your love in the music of bringing together, you know, the avant garde and mainstream in the same breath. Yeah. You know, these, these mark markers that we put between communities. Mm, really unhealthy. And I got to New York in the in the early 90s and you could hear those, uh, you could hear sense in the conversations like, yeah, we don't really fuck with them and they don't really fuck with us. You know, like you heard that. They're really unhealthy, really lame, you know. Um, and I also didn't think those people weren't producing the best music either. <laughs> so for me, the evidence was like, well, you know, also. Eh. I think it still goes <laughs> on. I mean, I, I think it still definitely happens. Definitely. And, you know, and then when I talk to people, musicians who you might think like are very like all the way over here there's so much gratitude and appreciation for how they learn something you know that you know that this thing is false that kind of like this construction of Mm -hmm. 
of these kind of schools that don't 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 get along with each other um because we all know that the music is bigger than that and um and it will take us getting over it to make something that's better more fluid more hopefully more real you know a lot of times in jazz people talk about truth i want to tell the truth and you know I'm also like, well, sometimes it's okay to lie. <laughs> I'm sorry, because I yeah. definitely can't believe everybody's telling the truth. You know, it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> what does it mean to tell the truth? It's hard to say, because I don't all the time. <laughs> I wouldn't be the best judge of right. it. For me, passion kind of may be a more applicable word to how I roll through music. Yeah. Um, I have passion, even passion for the lie. The lie is sometimes like how you might play behind a solo that's like boring, right? So you're just kind of like, I'm just there. I'm not into this, right? And if we're going to play for the honest truth part, you know, that you can hear some bands do. And when you hear it, it's like overwhelming. You know the feeling when you hear a band that's like, no, nah, we are invested in what we're saying right now. Yes. That feels totally different. Yes. Totally different. And that's not a thing I can kind of quantify in words, but the feeling is there. So... I know that when that moment happens, then then I've hit something that's powerful. I think maybe part of the teaching of playing jazz is how much is unspeakable. For all the talking that we're doing, what you're saying is I don't have words to explain how that happens. or I couldn't say to the guys yeah. in the band, okay, today we're going to do that thing, okay? We're going to do that. You can't do it that way. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah. When I was doing this monk research, there's a moment where he's in a conversation with uh, his arranger, Hall Overton, yeah. and they were having these discussions at, I think it was at MoMA, and uh, and Hall Overton asks him something, Monk something, and Monk says, uh, well, rather than say it, can't I just play it? <laughs> and I was like, ah. Which is so deep because he knew, he, he knew what he wanted so specifically. I mean, he definitely knew what he wanted. I think in that moment in front of the audience, he was like, eh. <laughs> well, no, but even if he knew what he wanted, he might not, he might not have, you know, had the, the language to say it, but he knew how to hear it. You know, maybe if that was the thing that I was remarking about with, Hearing Louis Armstrong and his wife in a hotel room in Buenos Aires looking at letters and trying to pronounce these words in Spanish. I mean, for me, that's powerful because it shows, you know, this new territory that they're kind of like confronting in private mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. Right. The intimacy of that learning, you know, of that kind of fixing your mouth, tongue to say a certain phrase like you would anything, you know, and he's dealing with it. He's like, how do you pronounce it? What's the, you know like he's like trying to find it and that's what being a musician is right for me that was like one of the great improvisations of armstrong <laughs> is watching him listening to him kind of like find that thrill. so do you have any sense of as you put together a, a project like this do you think about how we're going to come back out of this going back into public spaces and whether or not we're you know we all hope to get down to the vanguard again sometime soon but like right what do you think performing in tight spaces or in large group settings like in a museum will be like i mean yeah. have you thought about how you might have to change your approach i actually sometimes i'm choosing not to think about it and you know having some blind faith that it will work itself out i mean of course i miss already the feeling of i think my body misses it my body misses the muscles that have to work to play a full set of solo piano, 90 minutes, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. My body misses that. It misses the activity of walking to and from a hotel room, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it misses that kind of interaction mm -hmm. with people. And I think when we come out, we do have to be more mindful about how, how we travel the music. You know, there was a lot of very flippant travel um, mm. that musicians used to do just to, you know, to do another gig. And, I, you know, I was a part of that. And I have to be, just personally, I have to be more conscious about what I'm signing myself up to do and really what it takes. Because as we're seeing, there was a lot that we were all putting ourselves under stress for, whether we felt it or not. I don't know. I mean, at the Kennedy Center, we don't know what to do, right? So the Village Vanguard doesn't know what to do. The NBA players, they don't know what to do. It's, so the one thing that I have faith in is that we're all kind of as this community of people who invite audiences, and which is wide, wide community then we'll all have to kind of brainstorm to figure out a way, a yeah. new way. But I have faith that it'll return. Have you gotten together in small groups independently and played with anybody? No. No. So when's the last time you played with a drummer? Oh, my God. Actually, you know what I'm <laughs> thankful to say? My last concert was with Eric Harland. It was uh, 
And we played the music to Ava DuVernay's documentary that I scored called The 13th. And it was at the beginning of the pandemic in early March mm -hmm. at the Kennedy Center in yeah. the concert hall. So the last concert I did was on the largest stage of the concert hall around a subject that we are all talking about right now. Yes. And Ava was there in a QA and a uh, with Michelle Norris from NPR. It was a powerful, powerful night. So that was the last time I played with the drummer playing the music for the film. I'm thankful for that. If that's my last experience, oh. <laughs> it'll look good. It'll look good on paper. The 13th Amendment loophole was immediately exploited. After the Civil War, African Americans were arrested in mass. It was our nation's first prison bill. You, were basically you have worked on some of the seminal contemporary projects that explore questions of race in America recently, uh, whether it was working with Eva DuVernay or putting music to the work of ta Coates. This has been a part of your thinking and of your output for a long time. Now, here we are in a moment in America when the world is really thinking about and talking about race in the country and considering that this might be some kind of a reckoning. But in fact, it's been informing your work for a long time. It has been with me and it has been in the work that I've been doing forever. Even if you didn't know it, it was yeah. always there. But working with storytellers like those two who are, you know, really in peak territory and also peak bandwidth, they really yes. hit a lot of souls with their work. That it's important to also have the sound that can that, that can attach itself to it, too. And we need those songs. And I felt like I had just good examples of people around me, whether they were famous or not, who were kind of a part of sewing together this fabric of, of resistance so that we had a shawl to pass to one another, to cloak each other in, to hide behind or to, to hold up in, you know, as a, as a protest moment, um, that we needed to be making work like that. And like I said, it will continue and it will have to continue for us to get to a place where the country is no longer acting immature. You know? Do you think that black jazz musicians have a different responsibility to the way they approach their careers or the way they communicate? than white or other jazz musicians of other races or other countries? I couldn't answer that question, but I would say that responsibility might be the wrong term because every person has a responsibility. Now, whether or not you're detracting from the future of the work by eliminating its history, uh, that's one that I think a lot of musicians are wrestling with how they promote kind of a white supremacy within jazz, right? And that comes up if we think about how songs are recorded. It's kind of why I'm talking about like who is really writing these songs that musicians are recording over and over and over and over again. Mm, like which model are we promoting over another, mm -hmm. right? So well, I love Gershwin too. I love Kurt Vile. I love Cole Porter, right? Somehow they got sewed up really neatly and cleverly, but I have to interrogate that too. Uh, I can't take it for just as a as a method for me to learn how to play standards. That code kind of gets kneaded into the dough in a way where you might not taste it, but it, is, it lives there. And I think every, it's everyone's responsibility to figure that out. That's a deep investigation. And I have to be honest with you, it is not one that I have made. I mean, I have made certain assumptions about the repertoire, and some of it has been that there was a beautiful interaction that took place between, mm. as you say, mm. these vehicles that were ready to be squeezed yeah, that, that yeah, there yeah. was something about them that just served the music that was developing but i don't question that it should be interrogated oh yeah that, oh there's this money attached to it anywhere there's money that's trouble right like there's a lot of money there's a, those records were popular yeah. right i think the power model happens when charlie parker says no, i'm just gonna take the changes so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna take the changes i'm put my own melody on it yeah. right that's power yeah. move right so we know I mean, he recorded some standards records too, but we really know a lot of his songs based on those changes. Well, sure. And, yeah, that is the power of shit. You know? Changes don't belong to anybody. And yet they were attached to these melodies, though they did serve the melodies. The changes did have a function. And then in those songs, right, like we like to say, you know, like in the same way that people would say, oh, you can't sample over this amount of the, right. yeah, the yeah. song or whatever, right, before you have to pay. Yeah. Right, so little of the song was the actual melody and much of it was the improvisation. <laughs> like if we did that, like what, what's that number, right? What's the number of melody to improvisation? What's that percentage, you know? Um, I mean, of course, we all know that the melody influences everything. Look, I'm a big believer in the melody. I'm a melody supporter until I die. But I also know that also what we are banking on is the intellect of these musicians to really create and create and create, yet somehow take all that they're creating it 
and shovel it back into their pot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's tricky. That's real tricky. Look, I don't know anything else except that's the passion I have for kind of like wanting to know these things, to 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 follow my nose and to like, oh, let's let, let's 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 understand a little bit more about that rather than take it at face value. My sort of cynical response in today's world is, you know, fortunately there's no money in jazz anymore, so nobody's going to get rich on it, you know. But yeah. even that's not even totally true. I mean, there's still a plenty of opportunity there's for still. exploitation and for for misuse and all that stuff, you know. Yeah, now it shows up in you know how streaming services work, right? So. You know, those are the battles that artists are having to yes. really be conscious of. It's yes. like, do I side with that side who says that my music can be available to people, yet I will never get anything, but it costs me a lot to make it, right? So, you know, it's a, so now it lives there, right? And it's not just us. And so there's a community of musicians trying to figure that out, too. Yes. We all need some kind of legislation for artists of the country to find a way just to be able to, we shouldn't have to depend on pain to produce, Right. That's my shit. Like, mm. We should not have to depend on that. I, you know, like I don't even know what kind of work I'd be making if I didn't have to always confront the pain. But you know, where you usually I'm put in check is when I go hear folk music, whether it's from Indonesia, mm-hmm. Japan, mm-hmm. Australia, yeah. you know, South Africa. When you hear just the songs of the tribe, just those set of songs sung that way with those instruments for that community in that environment. <laughs> it hits me like a ton of bricks. Yes. Like I have to really think about what I'm doing. And it's a it's a reckoning moment. And so I have thoughts that like the folk musician is making the work for the community and they are in touch with them every day, you know. I think talking about folk musician or folk music in terms of the history of jazz can sound in some ways demeaning or something. I mean, I, mm. but I often have felt like I'm a musician. I play music a lot with my father, who's a piano player. And I often mm. have felt like I feel like a folk musician. I feel like mm. the, the, the version of the music that we play is a kind of folk music. That's true. You know, I used to not understand the phrase that jazz is America's classical music. Right. Right. Like, because it compares it to something that has its own relevance, you know, somewhere else. But in, and also thinking, well, what does it do? What is blues, right? <laughs> what is hip hop, you know? <laughs> but there was something that is sewn into the fabric of this country that the music represents that is real, right? And having my kid, you know, if there's something I'm listening to my for my kids, it's like, do they hear, if they hear me practicing James B. Johnson, do they hear it in that little baby song that's <laughs> that's on the radio, right? Do they hear the way those things connect or do they not, right? And I'm not going to ask. Yeah. I'm just going to let those sounds live in the same house. Yeah. And they'll, you know, they'll process it however they do. I have a major question about what, just literally what has happened to the dotted eighth feel or the swing feel in the American rhythmic psyche. Sure, yeah. Because yeah. if you check out what people are dancing to, it's not swung. That's not in the pop culture. For me, and I'm sure a lot of other people would say this too, they say the reason uh, you don't swing is, uh, or we don't try to learn how to swing is because the shit's really fucking hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this shit sounds simple. That shit is hard. Yeah. To make it feel good, it's like so hard. It's like, you know, like learning Mozart. The total, the technique is totally different, yeah. right? Like that means I have to like sit and really like get into, because it's not like you don't hear it everywhere. So that means you got to find it. And it's like the other thing about the, the truth or passion thing. Yeah. When you hear a band that's really swinging, like that's living today, yeah. which is also very rare. <laughs> but when you hear it, it's like, Phew. yeah. when I hear Hurlin Riley yeah. sit and play some quarter notes, yeah. it's like, oh my God. Yeah. Or like, you know, Jimmy Cobb just passed. That feeling, I mean, he's, of course, he's an architect of it. Yes. It excites you in a way that I think sometimes, you know, it would come up when I play these Thelonious Monk concerts, right? It was like, okay, I'm gonna spend a whole night yep. up in here, yep. right? Yep. Up in some medium tempo. And the high I would get from playing that music, you know, of course we move it all around and stuff, but still focusing on that, it felt so great, you know? But it, but yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to do, so it's difficult to teach. You know what knocked me out was how hard Monk's tap dancing was swinging when you played to that thing of him just oh yeah stomping did you loop it i looped it yeah 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 yeah. it was so swinging it was really like it was in his body 
It's in his body. For a lot of what identity really revolves around is the relationship to the body, period. And you have to reckon with it, whether it's what you think your spiritual sense is, but it's really the, the mass that you have as a human being and when you walk into a room and how it relates to another person. Yes. And Monk is in his body. Cecil Taylor is in his body. And you see it when he plays. And um, that's stuff I die for. That's Those are goals, right? To be, I'm learning, I'm still learning my body, but those are the goals of, to, to have any of that relationship. Because yeah, Monk really knew how to dance. <laughs> my father tells a story about working with Dizzy Gillespie Towards the end of Dizzy's life, they were working on a TV show, I think. My dad was probably producing it, and Dizzy was featured in the program. And But there was something going on with Dizzy's lip where he couldn't play. He had a cyst or a lesion or something on his lip, and he wasn't really able to play. And the story that my father tells is about how Dizzy managed to, through the sheer power of his personality... And through all of the techniques and strategies and routines that he had devised over the course of his career, he swung the band. He swung as a person without really having to play uh, very much trumpet. He kind of apparently held the trumpet up to his lips and blew a note or two, but never really took a proper solo. He sang, scatted, he told some jokes. He kind of managed and directed the band, and when it was all said and done, nobody really noticed that he hadn't played much trumpet because he himself was swinging so hard as a person. That's great. Yeah, yeah, Dizzy. God. I mean, you know, talk about a person who needs more. Like, you know, like, you know, there's also eras too, right? So like, you know, we're coming up in an era that's still related to that. Dizzy's still around, right? So then now, like, you know, but he passes, and then so now it's a new era, of crew of people who are don't see that in, yes. in in person anymore, right? He's not kind of like a part of the, you know, the the scene in a yeah. way, and you know, I mean, I think Dizzy. Mm, there's a lot to talk about with Dizzy. You know, there's a lot to talk about with him. Much more, like I think he he really needs that investigation. And people have to keep doing it over and over in yeah. public too to help us understand him some more. Because uh, he comes up in, of course, in Louis Armstrong's life, you know, and like they, like they, you know, they they parry each other, they're around each other a lot, you know, as brass folks. And um, I was sending a picture to Dave Holland the other day of him on the cover of this magazine, and I told him I was working. This was in the yeah. Louis Armstrong archive, yeah. and he was like, "Oh man, I never forget playing in Harlem in like 1970 mm. with Miles." And and Louis Armstrong came to the gig. Wow. And he said, I just remember sitting sitting and watching Armstrong and Miles sit at the bar. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Yes. They know that they're in the same world with each other. Yes. Right. So, you know, there's an era of musicians who have, you know, who have departed. McCoy, rest his beautiful soul, has is not here anymore. Um, and so people won't get to see that. But I'm here to tell them about them. You become the <laughs> yeah. leader. You become the embodiment of this thing. Sure. Yeah. And then you yeah. pass that along. It ha- you have to. It's um, giving out seeds, you know. Yes. Um, you got to do it. You got to do it. Well, Jason Moran, thank you for giving out some seeds today here with me. Nah, my pleasure, brother. It was good to meet you. There he was, Jason Moran. We got into it. I'm not even sure if we got out of it or if we just stayed down in it, but I'm ready to go back in and listen again. I'll be back again faster than you can say Carolina shout with another deep dive. Until then, I'll talk to you soon.